seen in the first Bond movie, Doctor No, where a glistening Ursula Andress emerges from the sea in a skimpy bikini right in front of the excited Sean Connery. Of course you remember it. It's one of the most famous arrivals in the movies. Well, what you may not know is that the inventor of James Bond, Ian Fleming, had a particular Quattrocento painting in mind when he imagined this unforgettable scene. It's a revolutionary painting produced in Florence in about 1485 of another goddess coming out of the sea. Not a screen goddess this time, but an ancient Roman one. Botticelli's Venus. The most celebrated nude goddess in art. Her face instantly recognizable, because this Venus has infiltrated popular consciousness to an unusually deep level. She's everywhere. But hold on a bit. Ursula Andress was meant to be sexy and stirring in that beefy Swiss way of hers. She was after big desires and sweaty passions. That's definitely not what Botticelli's Venus is trying to do. The Venus doesn't do sweatiness. She is to Ursula Andress what an orchid is to a T-bone steak. She's delicate, fragile, modest. And I've always thought there's something of the Lady Di about her. That shy tilt of the neck, the little look down, the fetching nervousness. But if Botticelli never had in mind the full-blooded arousal of all those who looked at his sensationally famous Venus arriving naked on the beach, which he didn't, what exactly was he after? The real trouble with the birth of Venus is that we just know it too well now. And so we have no way of trying to arrive back at the moment in art and in Western culture when it didn't exist. Because if we could get back to that moment, then we would understand in a very visceral as well as intellectual way what a revolutionary painting it was and in some ways still is. Botticelli's real name was Alessandro di Mariano di Vanni Filippi. He was born in Florence, where that house is behind me, in 1444, in the parish of All Saints, Ogni Santi. His father, a leather worker, was 50 when Sandro was born. His mother was well over 40. That's late, even by modern standards. In Renaissance times, it was asking for health troubles. Little Sandro was the Filippi's fourth son, the runt of his litter. All his life, people would say about him, Sandro bello e mal sacro. Sandro is handsome but unhealthy. He was always pale, apparently, and don't you think that some of this inherent paleness found its way into his art? two recorded explanations for why Alessandro dei Filippi came to be called Botticelli. The more boring of the two is that Botticelli is a corruption of the word battigello, which means someone who beats gold. When Botticelli was a teenager, he was apprenticed to a Florentine goldsmith and may indeed have been just such a battigello or gold beater. His art always maintained a most fruitful relationship with gold. That's certainly true. Gold pops up in his paintings in lovely and interesting ways.
But the explanation which I prefer for the origin of the name Botticelli is that it comes from his elder brother Giovanni, a successful city banker who was notoriously fat and therefore nicknamed Botticella, which means a barrel or a tub. Thus his sickly younger brother became little barrel Botticelli. It could be true. What's sure is that when he was in his mid-teens, Little Barrel gave up goldsmithery and began his apprenticeship as a painter. And that delicacy of his, that slight sickliness which contemporaries remembered about him, gave him an advantage when it came to producing pictures of rare Florentine exquisiteness. Is there not something highly strung and frangible about all his art? As far as we can tell, these big Botticelli paintings were basically furniture paintings. It may seem uh, an odd way to regard them, these great, cherished, multi-million pound masterpieces, but they were part of interior decoration, high-minded interior decoration of people who were very educated. And these are elite pictures for a very small circle of people. Um, they certainly were not for public consumption. This is the street in which Botticelli lived and worked until his death, and behind me is the house in which he must have painted The Birth of Venus. One of Botticelli's neighbours in this street gave his name to a country you may have heard of, America. He was Amerigo Vespucci, the great navigator. The Vespucci's were the richest and most powerful family in this locale, and Botticelli was soon working for them. In Italian, Vespa means wasp. That's why those annoying little scooters that buzz around Italian cities at night, right outside my hotel as a rule, are called Vespas. The wasp was the Vespucci family's symbol. See the wasps going into the hole in the tree there? They're an indication that this intriguing Botticelli was painted for the Vespucci family. And she's curious. She's one of the many women in Botticelli's art who at some point in their history have been identified as a portrait of Simonetta Vespucci. Simonetta was a much admired Florentine beauty who married into the Vespucci family. And there's a persistent rumor in art that she was also the model for Botticelli's Venus. But there's no evidence for this of any kind. In any case, Botticelli's women have a certain interchangeability to them, a group look. I really doubt whether this is Simonetta Vespucci. But what is intriguing is that this woman, although she's managed to hang on to all her clothes, is also a Venus. She's shown here with Mars, the god of war, whom she's tamed by exhausting him. How? Well, what do you think? Today, we all know Venus is the goddess of love. I'm your Venus, I'm your fire. What's your desire? And all that. But that's not how she began. Originally, Venus was a minor Roman goddess charged with the safekeeping of town gardens and vineyards, the goddess of allotments, if you like. It was only when this minor horticultural deity of the Romans took on and absorbed the identity of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, that she grew into the potent and popular mythological starlet so many have since desired. Botticelli's most significant patrons were not, in the end, the Vespucci, but an even wealthier and more powerful Florentine family, those fabulously potent Firenze bankers, the Medici, who essentially ruled the city. And this rather gloomy rural retreat was owned by one of the lesser Medici, Lorenzo de Pierfrancesco de Medici. Essentially, this was his summer house, 
And somewhere in here, we don't know where, Botticelli's Birth of Venus used to hang. We don't know how it got here, we don't know when it got here, and we're not sure why it got here, but we do know that it used to hang somewhere in this gloomy rural retreat, alongside yet another of Botticelli's remarkable love nest of Venuses. I hope you're feeling clever, because this painting takes a lot of keeping up with. It's called La Primavera, the spring, and it features Venus again. She's the one standing in the middle, rather quietly, but we know it's her because there's Cupid, her son, firing off arrows of love above her head. Over here, very important figure, because the picture really moves from this side to the other side. Over here, blowing out his cheeks, is Zephyr, the god of the west wind. Now, Zephyr is blowing away winter and therefore, as it were, ushering in the spring. And as you can see, he's chasing this nymph here. She's Chloris. Zephyr fell in love with Chloris, but Chloris wasn't interested. He took her anyway. And what's happening is that the act of taking Chloris results in her transformation because she changes into Flora, the goddess of spring. Venus, as we said, is in the middle, with Cupid above her, and she's attended by her usual attendants, the Three Graces, joyously dancing. And over here, finally, is Mercury, waving his wand at the clouds to dispel them, and therefore preparing for the spring again. Now, he is probably a slightly disguised portrait of Lorenzo de' Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent, as he was called. If it is him, he's the one who commissioned this picture. And if he commissioned it, he probably did it because one of his cousins, Lorenzo di Pierfrancesco de' Medici, who lived in the Villa di Castello, was getting married. And this painting was meant to be an encouragement to him. And indeed, it was meant to provide advice about fertility and how to bring out the best in your bride. It could be that the bride was a touch reluctant, like Chloris, and that she had to be forced into the marriage. But even if she was, it results in all this. In this astonishing, blooming, wonderful, flower-filled spring. This is one of the world's greatest ever evocations of fertility. Remember, this used to hang too alongside the birth of Venus in the Villa de Castello. So are there any clues here to the kind of meaning we should be expecting from the birth of Venus? Of course there are. has mystery. The Venus de Milo has a great body. But Botticelli's Venus has the whole package. Mystery, a great body, hair that could drive a man wild with entanglement and something else. An X factor. I've been puzzling over what this X factor might be for a couple of decades now coming over to Florence, trying to work out why this particular woman toots so many people's horns. And I've come to believe that what gets us in the end is her vulnerability. Sure, all us guys want to jump into that picture with her and study some Latin, but we also want to protect her, to wrap that cloak about her. She's come out of her shell on this blustery day, so cold, so fragile, so hesitant, and she looks so exposed. She needs us. Botticelli's Venus makes us feel wanted. That amusing English poet, Alexander Pope, who was much taken with beautiful women, wrote once about a particularly gorgeous lady at court. Has she no faults then, somebody asks him in the poem. Yes, she has one, I must aver, replies Pope. When all the world conspires to praise her, the woman's deaf and does not hear. Doesn't that remind you of Botticelli's Venus? 
She's outrageously beautiful, yet so embroiled is she in her own thoughts that she appears to be deaf to our praises and can't even hear our tongues hitting the tabletop at the sight of her. When you first look at her, you think she's beautiful. But when you actually study her, there are two particular things that are sort of wrong with her. It is to do with her left shoulder. If you think about it and actually study the painting, her left shoulder is uncomfortably low. I'll do this Quasimodo in interpretation. You can see it actually sort of does that down there. But the neck and the shoulder together do look slightly strange when your eye concentrates upon them. Um, and for me, the strange bit is looking at her foot as it stands on the shell, where there's a sort of bump in that way that slightly old ladies get bumps when they try and put their slightly large feet into small shoes. And my eye is often drawn to that. And, and then I think, oh, I forgive him. She's been on the shell a long time. And you know, maybe she's got cramp or whatever. But funny enough, it's not an anatomically beautiful body, but it is um, an aesthetically incredibly pleasing one. She was painted in around 1485. Maybe for Lorenzo di Pierfrancesco again. What is obvious is that this modesty she has, that shyness, the Lady Di look, is definitely intentional. We know this because her pose is based directly on a Roman statue owned by the Medici, the so-called Venus Pudica, or Modest Venus. This Roman Venus covers herself up and hides her bits. She symbolises the sort of modesty that Florentines demanded of their women, particularly when they entered into marriage. So, although Botticelli's Venus is naked, indeed, she's the first great mythological nude of the Renaissance, and she's nearly life-sized to boot, despite all that, the effect Botticelli wanted to convey with her was surely one of modesty, not of exposure. Though I don't think Botticelli's birth of Venus is meant to be erotic, there is no doubt that she does open the door in Western art to the nude as carnal. And you only have to go 50 years down the line to Titian painting the Venus of Urbino, where you have a beautiful naked woman lying on a couch, incredibly aware of her own erotic teasing and sort of saying, I am available sexually. And there begins such a great and terrible history of Western art and the female nude, which is about men looking at her and her needing to be desired. Now, I don't think Botticelli did that with Venus. I think that face still has the self-containment of the knowledge of some spirituality to it. But certainly once the cat is out of the bag, once the clothes are off the body, you can't control where it goes. This is Hesiod's Theogony. It's the classical text that most clearly describes the birth of Venus. It's a hell of a story, blood curdling. Uranus, the god of the sky, was being a beast to his mother and lover, Gaia, the Earth. So Gaia persuaded their son, Kronos, a titan, to sneak up on Uranus while he was making love to Gaia and to cut off his testicles. Kronos then chucked these genitals into the sea. He lopped them off with the flint and threw them from the mainland into the great wash of the seawater, and they drifted a while on the open sea and there spread into a circle of white foam. And from this circle of white foam grew a girl, Venus, or Aphrodite as she was first called. Thus Venus was the nautical fruit of Uranus's frothing testicles. Now unless my eyes are failing me completely, none of this bears any relation to anything we can see in the Botticelli. We've got a naked Venus in a shell, the shell's in the sea, and she's surrounded by a cluster of mythological figures. But surely no one here is being born. 
no frothing, no castration, no testicles. Yet if this isn't the birth of Venus, as we've been misinformed for hundreds of years, what else could it be? Let's have a close look at all this nature on show here, this excellent horticulture. There's plenty of it, and it's all meaningful. This little plant here between her legs, that's an anemone, a lovely spring favourite, which, according to legend, only grows when there's a warm wind. So the ancients used to call it the windflower. And lo and behold, up here in the corner is our old friend Zephyr, bringer of the warm wind and an inveterate blower. Zephyr isn't only blowing the anemone to life, look at all those roses pouring out of his mouth as well. The rose is specifically Venus's flower. The ancients believed that it only came into being at a very important moment, the first time Venus set foot on dry land. We've got the land here all right. These are orange trees, the ancient symbols of the Medici. And this figure here, she's probably one of the Hore, the embodiments of the seasons. She's the Hore of spring, I warrant. Look at these gorgeous cornflowers painted on her dress. And see here, she's wearing a girdle of roses. The Hore is handing a cloak to Venus so that the modest Venus can cover herself. So what does it all mean? Well, it means that the painting seems to celebrate an important arrival, an arrival that brings fertility. Is it therefore another marriage painting, joyously commissioned to celebrate the arrival in the Medici family of another fertile bride? I think so. But that's conjecture. What's certain is that this isn't the birth of Venus, it's her disembarkation. She's arrived somewhere on her shell, and when she touches the land, it blooms. What could this be, then? Well, I think it's in here again. Hesiod's Theogony. Having been born of Uranus's testicles and drifted across the sea, Venus made her way to sea-washed Cyprus and stepped ashore, a modest, lovely goddess, and about her slender feet, the grass grew. So, the painting we've been calling The Birth of Venus ought properly to be called Venus, having been born of Uranus's testicles, arrives in Cyprus and makes things grow. But for some reason, that title never caught on. There are a million stories in the world of art. This has been just one of them.